welcome to this Harp Day event. It's so nice to see all of you. Uh, thank you all for, for coming today. Uh, before I forget, I would like to thank the Historical Harp Society of Ireland for hosting this event. My name is Karen Loomis. Uh, I know it says in my um, little icon square there, the Historical Harp Society of Ireland. I'm Karen Loomis. I'm the host of this event today. I would, uh, in addition to thanking the Historical Harp Society of Ireland, I would also like to thank Harp Ireland for sponsoring this event today. And um, in this workshop, we are going to look at where the historical harpers place their hands on their harps. And we're actually going to start with, a, with a, a little exercise or task that will bring you a greater awareness of where you of your own playing style. And then we're going to look at the evidence on the historical harps and what that tells us about how those harps were played. We're going to look at that information and how you can use that to inform and develop your own playing style. Uh, afterwards, if, if we have time, we're going to look at some other signs of use left behind by the historical players on their instruments. There are um, around 18 surviving historical instruments. Um, and each one of them has, of course, its own life story. And the people who played them left behind telltale signs of use on them that, that tell a story about that instrument. Let me just, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to switch my view and I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me for a second while I do that. Okay, can you see my shared screen? Excellent, thank you. That, that's always good to know. Okay, and also uh, feel for, thank you for keeping yourselves muted. Uh, everyone knows the drill now, right? We're, we're, we're all Zoom savvy now because uh, it helps to cut down on background cross chatter. However, if you have a question at any point during this workshop, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question because I am um, hosting this and I'm, I'm flying solo right now today. I don't have a, a, um, another person checking the chat window for me and, and so forth. So I might not see the chat window, especially while I'm sharing my screen. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and and say your question out loud uh, just in case I, I haven't seen you know if you if you typed a question into the chat window okay otherwise thank you all again for keeping yourselves muted it, cut, it just cuts down on on sort of background cross chatter okay so i might let me just put my I, let me put my harp down for a second because it's easier for me there we go. It's easier for me to um, press keys on my keyboard if I don't have one hand holding my heart. Okay. Now, each of the surviving historical early Irish harps or early Scottish harps probably enjoyed many, many years of use. And we can actually see evidence of that on the sound boxes of these instruments where the player's hands, wrists, and forearms rubbed against the wood and wore it down. And here's a photograph of the Queen Mary harp 
which is at the National Museum of Scotland. And let me just go to my next slide here. Here, um, here's a close up of that harp lying on its back. And you can see in this photo of the Queen Mary harp where the edge of the sound box is worn down on the left side. And I don't know if you can, uh, depending upon how you have your view, um, if, I, I, if the gallery might be hiding that a little bit, you might want to move the, the little gallery that has people in it. Uh, but on the far right of your screen, if you look at the edge of the sound box, and again, you might need to move the little icon windows of, of people to see that. There's, it's worn in, it's really deeply worn in. And I've got an arrow pointing that out. Um, and uh, that's from, that's actually from the person, from people playing that instrument and their wrist rubbing against the side of the sound box. And although it shows pretty well in this particular photograph, this kind of wear often doesn't show often doesn't show up well in photographs at all and it's best observed in person um, so that we can you know look at the harp from different angles uh, in different lighting and actually adequate lighting is absolutely essential to see the full extent of the wear and you can actually overlook the wear entirely if you don't have really good lighting to observe it now, depending on how long you've been playing your harp, you, you may be able to see signs of wear on your own sound box. Um, the wear on the historical harps is the result of years of use, however, and it, it really takes a lot of repeated use before wear begins to be visible. So um, for many of you, there may not be obvious signs of wear on the edges of your sound box where your arms and wrists rub up against it when you play. But I want you to be aware of where you're placing your arms on your harp. So for this workshop, we're, you're going to observe and record your own hand and arm positions on your harp. And we'll then take a look at the positions of the wear marks on the historical harps um, so that you can compare these to where you're placing your hands and arms on your harp. And afterwards, I'll, I'll demonstrate and talk about some of the things that can affect where you place your hands and arms on your harp and how this is connected to the choices, either conscious or subconscious, that you make when you play your harp. Okay, so for this exercise, um, uh, and those of you, for those of you who don't have a harp, you know, you can just follow along. Yeah, obviously, you don't have to do this. But um, for this exercise, you'll need a pencil and a piece of paper and your harp. And um, you can, we're going to do it kind of quickly today, but this is something you can go back and do again later at a more leisurely pace on your own. And actually, you might even want to do uh, at some point do a video uh, of yourself playing your harp or have someone watch you playing your harp so that you can, you know, really get a good look uh, at where you're holding your harp and where you're placing your um, hands, arms and wrists when you play. But for today, what I'd like you to do on your piece of paper is sketch out the outline of your harp sound box, like I've like the example I've shown here. This is just a rough sketch. It, you don't have to be artistic. No one is going to see this. You do not have to show your sketch to anyone else. This is for you alone. Okay, so don't worry. 
It doesn't have to be neat and artistic. It doesn't have to be exact. But trying to get the proportions reasonably close to your own heart. Okay, so nobody has to go out and get a tape measure or anything like that. It's just a rough sketch, just a sketch. Then add in the string holes and try to put in the correct number of string holes for your harp. If that's if that's a little bit overwhelming to do right now, you can do that later. No, don't worry about that right now, but it actually helps to have the string holes in there and have the right number. And I'll give you time to do all this, so don't worry. Last, draw in the sound holes. And again, try to, this is just a sketch. It's not a technical drawing. So don't worry, it's not a blueprint. It doesn't have to be exact. But try to get them you know, reasonably in the right place where they are in your heart. And actually, the more the closer this sketch that you're making is to your actual heart, the more useful this exercise will be for you. So if this is something you want to do later on at your at your leisure, when you have more time to, you know, draw your your sketch more accurately, that that might be something you want to do. And um, if you're um, if your harp has the arches at the top end of the sound box, the little eyebrows, we call them, you can put those in too, but don't worry if you don't. Now, if your harp happens to be modeled after one of the historical instruments, like, for example, the Queen Mary I'm showing here, write that down on your sketch as a reference. If your harp isn't modeled after uh, any particular historical harp, you can write down whether it's a low headed or a high headed style. And that's, by the way, that's for those of you who have a metal strung harp, a wire strung harp. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these, the, these two types of harps, the low headed harps have a shorter four pillar. This is the four pillar here. And shorter bass strings and are shaped like the Trinity College Brian Baru harp shown here. So this is an example of a low headed early Irish harp, low headed wire strung harp. The high headed harps have a taller four pillar and longer bass strings. And one well-known harp of, of the high-headed type is the downhill harp, which is on display at the Guinness Storehouse Museum in Dublin. And that's, the, here's a picture of the downhill harp there. If you're not sure which type yours is, or it's just not clearly one or the other, just leave that information blank. Don't worry about it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys a, a, a minute or two to, to make your sketch because I would really like you, if, if you can, even if you just have to do it quickly and really rough and messy, don't worry, nobody's going to see it. You don't have to show it to anybody, but it, I, I really want you to try to do the exercise that we're, we're about to do before we look at the um, historical harps and the where the wear marks are on those instruments and the, the reason is uh i'm not trying to catch anybody out it's actually more helpful to you to do this without any um to do it completely unconsciously uh so that you're actually seeing and making a note of how you normally hold your own harp because what we're going to do, once you've made your sketch, um, what I'd like you to do 
today during this workshop is situate yourself with your harp and you can if you need to move away from your laptop to do it that's fine uh, if you need to you know go somewhere else in the room but what i'd like you to do is sit with your harp where you would normally play it like for example where you practice or or at least in a similar size chair or setup you know as you would normally comfortably play it on day-to-day -day basis and um so use basically the same seating and uh setup that you would normally use and what i would like you to do today is go ahead and play your harp a little bit and play something like just pretend you're practicing and again you can turn off your video for this you can move away from the, from the laptop i don't need to see you doing this in fact i don't want you to think i'm watching you no you you want to be doing this completely unconsciously because this is just information for you not for anybody else okay nobody has to see what you're doing here uh, this is for you for your information uh, I want you to, you know, not feel self-conscious at all. Uh, I just want you to be comfortable. Just pretend nobody's, nobody's here. Nobody's, nobody's seeing you. You can turn off your camera. You can step away from the laptop. And because um, I want you to just totally unselfconsciously be sitting comfortably at your heart as you normally would when you're practicing. Um, and what I would like you to do it as you do that you can play a little bit of something that you would normally play just totally relaxed because what i would like you to do is make a note of where you're placing your hands and wrists in here let me um let me go out of screen sharing hang on a second so i can demonstrate so, let's see okay let me show you what i mean Okay, and let me tilt my camera down so you can see a little bit. Sorry if my head is cut off, but I want you to just see my harp for a minute here. Okay, so what I'm talking about is, so here I am sitting at my harp, and um, so what I'd like you to make a note of as you're sitting at your harp, play a little something, and I'd like you to note the highest point and the lowest point that you're placing each of your arms. So for example, let's say if I was playing, I might bring my, my right arm, uh, my base arm up to here and maybe down to here. So let's say, so I want you to make a note of, of the highest point and the lowest point where you're moving your arm as you're playing your harp. And the way you can uh, reference that is count your string holes. So let's say I'm, I'm playing and here's my highest point. Well, where is that? Okay, I can just, I don't have to get out a ruler or measuring tape. All I need to do is count the, the string holes and use them as my point of reference. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, looks like 10 you know and and then count down here count down to the the string hole that lines up with the lowest point that you're putting your arm so you're using your string holes kind of like as a ruler okay as a convenient reference for where you're placing your arm we're not talking about which strings i'm playing okay we're just using them as a as a guide to so i can see as a measurement guide so I want to see how high am I bringing my arm up? How low am I putting it down here? And what's the range of motion of my arm along the side of the sound box as I'm playing? And do the same thing for your other arm and your other wrist. You know, and so sit there and pretend you're practicing. Nobody can see what you're doing, so don't feel self-conscious. This is just for you. And by the way, you don't have to show your sketch to anybody. You don't have to show it to me or anybody else unless you want to, right? So don't worry about anybody seeing what you're doing. And again, for, for this hand, you know, just play something and make a note of, you know, how high up are you bringing your hand? Use Count the string holes, use those as a reference, and how low down are you bringing it? 
and write that down. Let me move this up so my head's not chopped off there. Write that down on your sketch. And what I'll do is I will give you, uh, let's take, you know, five minutes or so, so that everybody has a chance to at least, you know, try to do that. Cause I, I, I think it's really helpful to you to do this exercise before we look at the historical harps to compare. It's actually more helpful to you uh, to do that first. Uh, also, does anyone have any questions about what to do? <laughs> it's a silence. <laughs> okay, you're either completely flummoxed or it all makes perfect sense. So what we'll do, we'll just, I'll just chit chat here and, and, and um, give you guys um, a few minutes to actually try that out. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to look, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not paying attention to what people are doing because I want you to not feel like I'm watching you. Okay. So I'm not watching you. I'm, I'm looking away. I'll, I'll look down at my notes and, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to actually, I can fill up that five minutes or so by talking about the harps. Just before we started um, this workshop, I was I was mentioning my instrument, um, which is modeled after the Lamont harp, um, and how I had researched that instrument and um, also the Queen Mary harp for my uh, PhD dissertation. Um, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with with me or my work, I, I suppose it might help if I. I guess I could take this moment to, to tell you about myself uh, while you guys are off doing your sketches and doing the exercise. I am um, an organologist, and that's a term that might be unfamiliar to some people. Organologists are uh, the people who research musical instruments. Um, I sometimes tell people, you know, organologists are the people who study, for example, Stradivarius violins to try to figure out the secrets to how they were built. Organology is the study of musical instruments. It's actually um, a, a field of research. It's, it's a profession. And um, my area of um, interest and in research is these historical metal strung harps of Ireland and Scotland. And so that's uh, why I studied the Queen Mary and the Lamont harp for my PhD research. And actually a little bit later in this workshop, I'm going to show you a really cool picture of the Queen Mary harp. Um, uh, my work is, um, I guess you could call it forensic, although I, I hesitate to use the word forensic because that implies there's a, there's a crime has been committed. There's no crime has been committed here, but I, it's it's like sleuthing. It's sort of like you know Sherlock Holmes type stuff where I'm looking at tiny clues uh, that tell a big story that that you know give us information about these instruments, how they were constructed, uh, what the craftsmanship is, um, how they were used and repaired, and how they were played. Um, and uh, so that's what I do. And a lot of that information goes into helping modern day builders of these harps make informed um, replica instruments of the historical harps. And one of the uh, one of the reasons um, players often like to have an instrument that is a copy of, it, of an existing historical instrument is because oftentimes the 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 instrument informs the way you play it, it affects the way you play the harp and we'll be talking kind of talking about that a little bit today as all of you know regardless of what kind of harp you have uh you know your harp affects the way you play it right just the the whole ergonomics of the instrument and the way it responds to you the way it feels when you hold it um and so we'll be we'll be talking a bit about that today after after you do that exercise. Um, so that's the kind of work that I do, um, and the I actually CT scanned the Queen Mary and Lamont harps, and a CT scan is 
like an x-ray, but in 3D. Uh, so you can actually imagine an x-ray that you can look at from all different angles. And this was the first time that that had been done for any of these um, early metal strung harps. Uh, so there was a whole treasure trove of new information uh, about how these harps were put together and um, how they, you know, different hidden repairs inside them. So that was very cool. The, um, the Queen Mary harp, um, I, I had a radiocarbon dated a few years ago. And the interesting thing about that is that up until that point, none of these early instruments had been analytically dated. So, you know, not the, the, the Brian Brew or the Queen Mary or any of these instruments that are so iconic. Um, if you looked at them in the museum, it, it said, you know, circa and then a date. And circa meaning, you know, around that date, we don't know for sure. Uh, so we didn't know for certain how old any of the really old instruments were. Some of the later ones um, have dates inscribed on them from when they were made. Uh, so we so we knew for those instruments that how old they were, but in particular for the oldest ones like Queen Mary and the Brian Brew and the Lamont Harp in particular, uh, we didn't know really how old they were. There we, uh, you know, there were educated guesses based on the decorative work and the style of the instruments, but without the analytical data, it was just educated guesses. Um, so I had the Queen Mary harp radiocarbon dated and um, very, very tiny samples, by the way. Um, the dating has um, improved in recent years where you don't need very much wood to do a date. So it's not like we took big chunks of wood out of the instrument. And we had each part of the frame dated separately to compare them, because one of the questions was, were all parts of the frame the same age? Um, and it turned out that um, they, within the uncertainty of the data, all three parts of that harp were the same age. And to make a long story short, um, you know, there's a lot of analysis that goes into turning the data into an actual estimated data construction. Um, but it turns out that the Queen Mary harp was most likely constructed between the um, second quarter of the 14th century, so around uh, 1325, and the first quarter of the 15th century, so somewhere between around 1325 and 1425 AD. And that's with a, a fairly high degree of confidence. And that was a really key uh, piece of information and really wonderful to find out. Okay, so now that I've, I've, I've used up all the time talking. Um, okay, so has everyone, have most of you had a chance to do this? Little exercise, great. I wanted to make sure I gave you all enough time. And as you can see, it's very easy for me to talk for a long time. So good, okay. Now, let me go back and share my screen again. Okay, and hopefully, yep, yeah. okay, you can see that. Okay, so we're gonna start, oh, let me put my harp down, it's a little bit hard to hold, hang on. Okay, we're gonna start with the Trinity College Brian Brew Harp. So now we're going to look at, okay, you've done your, your bit. So, okay, what were the historical harpers doing? That's what we're going to look at now so that you can compare. Uh, we're going to start with the Trinity College Brian Brew Harp. Uh, I, I know a, there are quite a few people out there, uh, and some of you today, uh, that have harps that are modeled after this instrument. So this will be really interesting for you to see. Now, this picture is um, was taken in the 1960s when the Trinity College Brian Baru harp underwent a big 
restoration project. It was actually strung up and played by the Harpers Mary Roland. And there are recordings of that instrument being played. Uh, they weren't able to bring it up to full tension because it's so old. Uh, now, this is something, by the way, that no museum would ever do today. But, uh, back 50 years ago, 50 plus years ago, almost 60, actually 60 years ago, um, they, they decided that it would be okay. We would never do this today. However, those recordings are out there. Um, and actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I should say it. Well, I guess I can say it. It's, I, um, I found out looking at the um, archival information about this, this restoration project, um, that uh, when they strung up the, the Trinity College harp back in the 1960s, they actually cracked the sound box because of the tension of the strings and had to repair it. So, and so, yeah, so we would never do this today because these old instruments are so fragile and the, the wood is, is somewhat compromised. A lot of these old harps have woodworm damage and the wood is really, really old. Uh, and that's when you string up a harp, you're putting a lot of tension on the sound box. Um, however, they, they did this and Mary Rowland played the instrument and, and much to her credit, she was a, extremely observant about how she was playing the instrument and about the, the wear marks, the, the wear, the visible wear on the sound box. And she actually wrote up um, her observations and it's really worth reading what she had to say about her experience playing this harp. And I wanted to read you a little bit of that. So let me read what she has written here. And this is what she has to say. The first time this harp was handled by me, it became immediately apparent that the deep wear marks on the sound box gave absolute indication as to the way it was held, i.e. on the left shoulder with the left hand playing the treble strings and the right hand, the bass. This is the reverse order to all modern harps, which are placed on the right shoulder with the right hand playing above the left as a general rule. Though both hands can be used at will anywhere within the compass of a modern harp. This is not so with the Trinity College harp for the depth of the wear marks also indicated that the harp had been held in position on its keel by the arms or wrists while playing thus giving each hand only a limited range of action. Only in a kneeling position or when sitting on a low stool with the harp standing on the floor, was it possible to fit the arms into the wear marks. Both a sitting position with the harp on the knee and a standing position with the harp resting on a table were tried and found impossible. In both these positions, it was subsequently found equally impossible to tune the harp because it was difficult to support it and to find the correct peg to turn at one and the same time. Sitting on a low stool was the best solution for the harp was then leaning against the chest supported by one knee and the two wrists. I am a big woman, five feet, six and a half inches in height and big boned so that a playing position comfortable to me will not be far removed from that adopted by the men who played this harp in the past. So So she makes an interesting observation about how she was only able to comfortably place her arms in the wear marks on the Trinity College Brian Baru harp if she was seated on a low stool with harp on the floor and the top of the harp resting against her chest. And we're, we're going to come back to that point about what effect the positioning of the harp has on where you can comfortably place your arms and wrist on the harp. And I want to emphasize again that um, this, this workshop isn't about telling you how to play your harp. 
Okay, it isn't about me saying you're doing it right or you know you're doing it wrong. Okay, um, you have your own style of playing your instrument, and this workshop is really about you gaining a deeper awareness uh, and insight from the historical harps that you can use to develop your own playing style. Okay. So the wear marks on the Trinity College harp. Now I didn't, this is one of the harps that I didn't have the opportunity to observe this under ideal lighting conditions. I had to look at it while it was in its case in the long room library at Trinity College. And, and some of you here may have been in there to, to see this harp, it's, it's on display there. Uh, and for those of you who haven't had a chance to do that, if you're ever in Dublin, it's worth making a trip to the Trinity College Long Room Library, and uh, you can see this harp in its case there. Um, however, I was able to, I did take notes from what I could see, and I was able to compare my notes with Robert Bruce Armstrong's detailed drawing of the sound box, which is shown here on the left. And my notes and his drawing agree fairly closely, so I'm feeling reasonably confident. Okay, so where were they rubbing against the sound box? Okay, so on the left side of the sound box, and for these historical instruments, as Mary Rowland noted, uh, traditionally, uh, historically, they were played uh, with the left hand in the treble and the right hand in the bass. And the harp would have been leaning against the, the left side of the chest or on the left shoulder. So on the left side of the Brian Baru harp, the, the visible wear extends from about the position of string hole number four to, let me just move my, no, hang on a second, I just wanted to move my thing out of the way. Uh, from string hole number four to around string hole number 10 or 11. And this is why it's helpful to, on your sketch, draw the, your string holes where they actually are, you know, the right number. You don't have to get exact, but, you know, reasonably close because we're just using these to note the position of the wear. We're not saying that they were playing these strings, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm just using them as a ruler, as a reference to, so I can see where the position of the wear is. And on the right side, the wear, visible wear is from about the position of string hole number 10 or 11 down to 16 or 17. Okay, and again, this isn't referring to the strings that they were playing. That's not what we're talking about. We're just using this, the string holes as a ruler to, to, as a reference point so that we can measure where the, the, wear, where the visible wear is. Uh, and I've, I've highlighted them on, on Armstrong's drawing here, just so you can see them better. The arrows that I've put in here mark the position of the deepest part of the wear. So that's where it was the deepest. That's... Now, if your harp happens to be modeled after the Trinity College Brian Brew harp, Note the position of the historical wear on your sketch. And um, when you made your sketch, what, what might be helpful is, you know, you've noted down where your wear is. You can draw a line or, you know, like I've done here, but just with your pencil, you can draw a line on your own sketch on each side, indicating where you're rubbing against your sound box. Okay. And then what you can do is uh, note down if you've got a Trinity replica, note down the position of the historical wear. So you can compare it to where you're rubbing against, where you're holding your own harp. I'm gonna leave that up for a second so that people can get a look at it. Now we're gonna look at the Queen Mary harp, which is similar to the Trinity harp in, in style. It's a, a tiny bit smaller. Let's see. Oh, I need to. There we go. Okay. 
So here's the Queen Mary harp. And I know there, there are quite a few people out here. I don't know if anyone today has a, a copy of the Queen Mary harp, but I do know there are quite a few people out there who play copies of the Queen Mary. Now I was, I observed the Queen Mary harp in the lab at the National Museum of Scotland uh, under good lab lighting. So I was really able to see the full extent of the wear. And on the left hand side of the sound box, the wear that I was able to see extends from string hole number two down to string hole number 15. So from all the way up here down to here. And on the right side, it extends from here around about where string hole number 10 is down to number 21. And again, I'm not referring to the strings they were playing. I'm just using the string holes as a point of reference so I can see where, so I can refer to the location of the wear. And if you happen to have a harp that's modeled after the Queen Mary, you can note this down on your sketch and compare it to where you're placing your own arms and wrists. And I, this is the Lamont harp, which is a little bit bigger than the Queen Mary. And I was also able to observe this under good lighting conditions. And let's look at the wear on this harp. Okay, so on the left side, the visible wear is from the, about the position of string hole number two down to about string hole number 10 or 11. And on the right side, the visible wear is at about the position of string hole number nine down to 20 or 21. And again, we're not referring to the strings they were playing. We're just using the string holes as a point of reference so that we can um, talk about the, the location of the wear. We're just using it as a ruler. Okay, so let's see. Oh, yes, there's one more of this type. Okay, so I looked at the Otway harp and um, I actually observed it not in a lab situation, uh, but it was in a room that was fairly well illuminated from the large windows. Um, it would be better to examine it in a lab, but this was, you know, this was sort of second best. Okay, so. Uh, and the Awe is a low, is, it's a low headed style harp. All the harps we've looked at so far are, are of the low headed style, but this one's uh, the biggest of the ones that we've looked at so far. On the left side, the visible wear is from about the location of string hole number three. So right about up here, down to where lined up with string hole number 17. And on the right side, it's, right about at string hole number 17 down to string hole number 26. And I should point out, I'm saying left and right with respect to the person holding the harp, okay? So when I talk about the right side of the harp, it's from the harp player's perspective, not from the perspective of somebody in the audience looking at the harp. So if you're saying, why does she have left and right reversed? That's why. So this is left and right are with reference to the person playing the instrument. So if you're holding the harp, this is the right hand side and this is the left hand side. Okay, so, so far, the harps that we've looked at are all the low headed type. And um, I mentioned the Queen Mary dates to the, the 14th or early 15th century. The, the Brian Brew harp, the Trinity College harp is probably about as old. Uh, the Laman harp may date to the middle of the 15th century, as I mentioned, and the Otway possibly to the 17th uh, or very early 18th century. The Otway may have been refurbished or partial, partially rebuilt in the early 18th century. So these are the older instruments, generally speaking. It's interesting to see uh, amongst these four harps the similarity in the position and the range of the wear, which suggests that the, you know, that the, the, the playing style, the performance practice was, was quite similar. 
Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't like everybody was doing their own thing and it was all different. And that's across a fairly long time period. We're talking about a, a 14th century harp and a late 17th or possibly early 18th century harp. And we're seeing very similar wear positions across that long time period. And that's that's quite interesting. And we're going to look at two more harps and then we're going to talk. OK, so this is the Hollybrook harp and the picture on the left is actually from a laser scan that I had done of this instrument. And I observed the Hollybrook in in the lab at the National Museum of Ireland. Uh, it is an 18th century instrument, and this is of the high headed type. So these are the, the later style of early Irish harp. And um, and again, I observed this harp under under good lighting con conditions, which is good because on these later instruments, um, the 18th century harps, the the wear is much lighter. It's less, much less obvious. Uh, they're they're not as old. Uh, could be you know one big reason that the wear isn't as deep, so they haven't been played as long. The Queen Mary harp, by the way. Um, we now know that it was, you know, most likely made in the in the, sometime in the 14th century. It was still being played in the early 18th century. There is an eyewitness account of the Queen Mary and the Lamont harps being played in the early 18th century. So that's a very long period of use that that harp was being played. And these 18th century harps, they're not as old. The, the wear on them is not as visible, but it is there if you have good lighting and you look at it and if, if you're looking for it. So, OK, so the Hollybrook harp, a high headed harp for, for if there's any of you out there who has a high headed harp on the left side, that's the side, the, the uh, wear that is visible extends from about the position of string hole number four to string hole number 13. And on the right side, it extends from about string hole number 13 to string hole number 24, that position there. And again, we're just using the string holes as a reference, not saying that they're playing these strings. Oh, one last thing I want to say. Now, I did notice there's a little bit of very light wear that extends farther down. It's almost invisible, but I thought I would mention it. So there's a little bit of light wear farther up and farther down on the Hollybrook harp. And um, let's see, did I? Oh yeah, so that lighter wear extends from around string hole number one all the way to the very top and all the way down to string hole number 23. So all the way down kind of in the, down past the middle of the range. Last one I'm gonna show you is the Mullamast harp. And that's a, it's a larger high headed harp. And uh, that's also at the National Museum of Ireland. It is also an 18th century instrument. Um, so this is helpful for those of you. There are some people who have and play replicas of this instrument. Um, and for those of you who happen to have and play a replica or a, a harp modeled after one of the high headed harps, this is useful for you. I, um, I observed the wear on this harp <clears throat> when it was in the storeroom at the museum on two separate occasions. I did not have this, I haven't had an opportunity to study this harp in detail. I actually saw it while I was on a, uh, a tour, a field trip on two occasions to the uh, storeroom with the Historical Harp Society of Ireland. Uh, so I didn't have the opportunity to observe it under optimal conditions. Um, so I'm less confident about my observations of the wear on this harp. But here's what I saw. So on the left side, I saw where from all the way at the very top, lined up with string hole number one down to about string hole number 13. And on the right side, that's the harp's right side, uh, from about string hole number 13 down to about string hole number 24. And um, so far, the all the harps, the high-headed and the low-headed are pretty consistent 
uh, with each other. But I have a surprise for you. <laughs> um, on the left side, that's this side, the, the, the Harper's left side, uh, of the Mullamast Harp, there's a second wear mark that I saw. And it's down here. What is that there for? Uh, and it goes from, it's from about string hole number 16 down to about string hole number 25. And um, I actually observed a similar wear pattern on the Sir Harp. The Sir Harp is another high-headed harp. It's a large high-headed harp. It's also at the National Museum of Ireland. I don't have a diagram for the Sir because I, I didn't note down the, uh, the actual position of the wear reference to the string holes. Um, but I can tell you that I did see this, this similar pattern where uh, there's one where, you know, there's wear up high in the treble here, and then there's a second separate wear mark. Uh, and there's a gap between the two of them. So it's not like one long one. There's two distinct uh, regions of wear. Um, and this is really interesting, both this harp and this sir. Um, they're both larger than the Hollybrook harp. They're both actually fairly large, high-headed high harps. And I, I wonder, you know, oh, what, is, what is this about? Because as I had mentioned to you, historically, the players, uh, this would have been the treble hand here on this side of the harp and the bass hand on this side. Um, now, so this is something for you to go away and think about because I don't have the answer to this. Maybe, you know, because these were large harps, were, were the players sometimes playing these instruments standing up and sometimes sitting down? I don't know. Were they doing, was there something about the performance practice that, you know, they're playing sometimes up here and sometimes down here? I don't know. Um, this wear was not as visible, not as deep as the wear up here. I don't believe on either harp. Uh, what I really want to do is go back and examine those two harps and the other surviving high-headed harps under really good lab lighting to confirm that that's actually what I'm seeing here. Because this is very interesting with regard to how these harps might have been played. But if you have any thoughts about this, you know, have go and have a think and feel free to write to me with your thoughts about that because, um, you know, that's, you know, that's something I don't know why that is. Okay, so now let me, let me turn off screen sharing. There, okay. And let me pick up my heart because I want to talk about, now we get to the fun part where, okay, I've given you lots of data and I hope I haven't bored, bored you to tears with the numbers, but this is the fun and useful part because this is where I'm going to talk about, let me tilt this down, just, sorry, my head's cut off a little bit because, but I want you to see the heart. Okay. So let's talk about what are the things that might affect where we place our arms and wrists on our instruments now that we've now that you've had a look uh, and a think about you know where you're placing your arms and wrists on your instrument and we've looked at the historical instruments. Um, and I'd like you to to think about, you know, what are the things that actually would affect that? Um, so, and actually on your piece of paper, you know, I want you to write down, what do you think? What are some of the things you think affect where, you know, where you're placing your arms and wrists on your instrument when you play it? Where, you know, what is affecting the location of your arms and wrists? And I'd like you to, um, I'd like you to, sorry if I'm making noise with my, my uh, microphone there, I apologize, I was moving my papers around. So I'd like you to um, write that down and, and, and think about this, because this is what this workshop is about, is about you starting to think about these things and getting a deeper awareness of uh, what's going on when you play your harp and what subconscious decisions you might be making. Okay, so uh, let's unmute, feel free to unmute yourselves. I'd love to hear 
someone chime in or speak up. So let me ask you, you guys, you know, what are some of the things you thought of? What affects where, where you place your arms on your heart? What do you think would, would change that? Physical disability. Oh, very good. I love that. That's, that's one I hadn't thought about. Whether you're playing um, a melody or um, accompanying someone else playing a melody. Mm, right, what you're playing. Yep. Yeah. I had thought, uh, um, go ahead. I'd written some questions down earlier. Um, which tune you're playing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What, what techniques you're using? And would it give us any indication of possible bass? Yeah, so what you're, yeah, I, I don't absolutely. want to call it harmon harmony because wire strung harps are, they're kind of not set up to, the music is not set up to think in terms of melody and harmony. It's, it's all, the hands are all interlinked a lot, but possible bass notes that you might play. Mm -hmm. Th this is great. Yeah, these are all, um, all things that can affect where you're, how you're holding your harp and where you're placing your arms and hands. Absolutely. Um, what about the, the chair or stool you're sitting on, the height of it? Absolutely. Yep, that's a good one too. Absolutely. And one of the things you want to think about is whatever you're doing, you want it to be comfortable, right? You, you want to... Um, you, you want to have good posture. You don't want to be doing something that's going to cause strain. Um, you know, you, you don't want to, to be holding your harp in a way that's, that's tiring, that's going to cause fatigue in your arms and hands. Uh, so comfort is key. And I don't know if you noticed Nancy Clark had a suggestion in the chat, which I don't know if she wants to say. Go ahead. Yeah, because I, I couldn't see the chat window. Let's see. Oh, OK. Hello. Everyone. Oh, hi. oh, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. I was wondering when you had the marks on the low and the high, if they were crisscrossing their hands, so the treble hand would be playing high and then it might reach down to play the bass uh, occasionally. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. And this is something that I think, um, I, again, I want to go back and look at those two harps to confirm what I'm seeing. Because again, I, I didn't have those under ideal lighting conditions when I was observing this. So I want to first confirm that that's what I saw. Uh, and then um, um, people who uh, research the repertory and the performance practice on the instruments, I would love to hear their thoughts, um, everyone's thoughts on, on this, because it's, it's yeah, it's it's one of these things like I don't have an answer. So that's great. Um, I'd love to hear all of this. Okay, so let's say for your instrument, uh, now that we've looked at, at the historical instruments and you've done the exercise, you uh, just say, want to, yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to make a, a, a remark about the cross hands practice. Mm -hmm. in, in the the picture you you show to us, mm -hmm. only the only the last have a, a, a similar. Um, uh, here I can mark. go back and show that again. Yeah. Uh, only mm -hmm. only this have a, a similar marks on the right and on the left. So. Okay. Yeah. So we're not seeing. Yeah. So the. The, the base hand on the right, yeah. it's, yeah, there's just this one where. Yeah. Exactly, and, yeah. And, and mm -hmm. other model uh, have no, uh, no marks uh, in similar position and. Um... In the trouble, yeah, correct. There's just on, on the right hand side of the heart, there's just this one wear mark here there's no yes. there's nothing up here and um yeah yeah so it was only on the left side that's the harper's left side 
where I saw this second wear mark down here. And it was yep. not as deep as this one. And again, I saw this on the Sir Harp as well. And this is something before anybody jumps to any conclusions, this is really, again, I need to go back and uh, look at these harps under better lighting conditions and, and examine them closely to confirm mm -hmm. what I'm seeing here. But so that but this is just something for people to think about that, you know, what what could be going on here. Um, so so thank you. Thank you for 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 saying that. That's it's I, I think I find this really fascinating. OK, so let's say, for example, uh, for your instrument, you're you know, we've done this exercise and. We looked at the historical hardware and yours are a little bit different. They're maybe not they don't line up They're They're you know, if you compare them, they're not quite the same as the historical wear marks on the historical harpers. And I might say that, you know, most of the people I have just sort of casually looked at today, most modern players or a lot of them uh, are not placing their arms and wrists in the same places as is indicated on the historical instrument, which means that something is being done differently. Okay. Um, and we can think about what is, you know, what might, uh, and as we've been talking about just now, what are the things that can, can change that? And one person mentioned the chair or the stool that you're sitting on. And, and for sure, uh, one thing that can affect where you uh, comfortably place your, and again, I apologize if my head's cut off, but I just want you to see the harp right now, uh, where you comfortably place your arms is the height of the instrument, right? And I've got a little box here. I want to demonstrate here for you just for a second. Let me put this up on a box. So I put it up. I'm going to put this up high. This is just as just as a demonstration. Now, I would not normally play hold my harp this high. Uh, I, I find it, you know, it's a little bit awkward to have it this high. But look at what happens if I just place my arms comfortably, you know, if I was just going to, you know, play something. Uh, I've got them down, I've got them down here, you know, I want to sit comfortably so that my um, forearm is kind of horizontal here and my my wrists are at a comfortable position, you know, I'm not I'm not doing any, I'm not twisting my wrists around in kind of a weird way and I'm not scrunching myself, I, you know, I'm just sitting comfortably and notice what has happened. If I lift the harp up, all of a sudden, my arms are lower down. And if I were to play like this every day, my I the wear marks on my instrument would be down here. Now, that's not what we're seeing on the historical instruments. Okay, so the height of the instrument affects where you're placing your arms. Well, does that matter? You know, does it does it change anything? Um, Well, and and actually, it 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 can make a difference. Um, you know, does you know it? So let's say I've got the harp like this, and I'm down here. Well, for one thing, if I'm if I want to play the treble strings up here, let me move this so that you can see me a little bit. There we go. So let's say I've got my heart positioned up high like this, and, I, and I, my hands are comfortable here. Well, if I want to reach these strings up here, I have to lift up my elbow to do that, you know. And I mean, I can do it, but I have to, you know, I have to have my elbow sticking out to do it. Uh, and I might be less inclined to play up there. I might play up there less often because it's just not as comfortable to stick my elbow out and play up here. I mean, I can reach it, but you know, it's not as, not as comfortable than playing down here. So I might subconsciously choose to play down here, these strings lower down because it's, it, it's just more comfortable to reach them rather than having to stick my arm out to get this. And this is just isn't that comfortable. So by moving the harp up, not only have I changed 
where I'm resting my arms on the sound box, I've actually subconsciously affected the choices that I'm making what in how I'm playing the harp and in what part of the compass I'm playing that you know where I want to be playing this instrument so I might choose repertory or I might choose arrangements of repertory or, or make my own arrangements that are lower down the instrument um, just because of the height that I have it now this is kind of a I, I moved it up a lot just so I could just so you could really see um but even if you change the height of your your chair or your stool or the harp just by a couple of inches that's going to affect how high up you're holding the the instrument how high up you're resting your arms on it and that in turn is going to affect some of the choices that you're making um and you know even subconsciously um and there are other things that can affect what part of the compass you choose to focus on and for example some instruments uh, let me put this down because it's a little bit uncomfortable hang on a second okay so i'm sitting on a low stool and i've got the harp. i've got my harp on the floor now different harps are different sizes so you know uh it's important for you to do what's comfortable for you with your harp okay and it's it's a, comfort is key and also you want to make sure that the let me move my hand up you want to make sure that you're not holding your wrist at an uncomfortable angle you don't want to be doing this or this because that's going to cause problems for your wrist right you want to make sure that your posture is good you don't want to have to be crouching down or you know doing something strange with your back or your wrists or your neck because that's going to that's going to cause strain and fatigue and and you don't want to make your life more difficult um, Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, the um, I, I'm fairly new to harping, and I have been instructed that I need to keep my left hand away from the sound box and my left arm elevated. That is um, a technique that I find very difficult because I have, uh, at, at my age, I have some sh a shoulder issue, and so I tend to have my arm gravitate down and rest there. I detect that comfort is the key and not necessarily technique per se. They, they follow on each other. Now, what kind of harp do you play? Thormalin Swan. Now, is that a is that a, a, a lever harp or is that a metal strung harp? It's a lever harp. Okay, yeah. So, so um, the technique for the lever harps is going to be different. And those of you who I'm not a lever harp player myself. So I don't want to um, give you an in instruction uh, that is going to conflict with what your teacher is telling you. And I know there's a couple other people here who today who are lever heart players, and maybe one of you could chime in. Is that the done thing with lever harps that you you don't you have your hand up off of the the sound box and the treble end? Um, there are two techniques, real. And I think it's based on the pedal harp people. The Salzado, which I sort of learned at first, was the off the soundboard. But the Grand Genie, the French method, actually does have the arm resting on the soundboard to play. So it may be that you may want to gravitate toward a, someone that is familiar with the French method, the classical method, or the Grand Genie. It's called any of those. Or look at Regnier, some of the old books on the uh, pedal harp instruction methods that come from France actually do advocate the arm on the soundboard. So uh, just there's some real advantages to the up in the air for freedom, but you know, there's also a speed and a comfort. And I know I've had some wrist injuries in the past and I find myself automatically putting my wrist on the soundboard. I, a Salzado teacher would not like me to do that, but that it's just a you know type of uh, technique and style. And within the classical harp community, both are good people. They've got orchestra positions. They're all very accomplished, but they're t entirely different techniques. So that's, I hope that helps you, Jack. I have a different uh, background. Um, I am uh, 
mostly a folk harp player. I've never had classical training, although I have taken lessons for, for many years. Um, and one of the things that I learned about from my harp teacher, as well as um, during my studies for certification as a um, music practitioner, um, is that you don't want to hold your instrument with your arm or your wrist in any way. It's okay if your arm or hand touches the instrument, but you don't want any weight on that. And the reason is injury prevention. Um, we would never put the weight of our uh, harp on the shoulder. You lean it against your knee instead. And um, we also tilt the instrument to us so that we have the good posture and the, you know, you don't injure your body in any way. And um, I don't know if you can tell in the video, but when I put my harp up, it's on my shoulder. It's not touching my shoulder at all. Um, I can move around and there's no weight on my shoulder, nothing to pinch the nerves in my shoulder that affect the hand movement as I use a harp. Um, and um, uh, the harp is also not straight on, like, you know, like straight in front of me, it's turned at an angle so that I can reach the strings and see the strings very well without having to have the weight on my body in any way other than pressing against my knee. That's, thank you both, that's great. That is, that's really um, helpful to have that, your information and perspective. Thank you, those, those were really helpful answers. And actually some of what you said uh, ties into what I was about to say here about these metal strung harps. Um, and I was about to talk about how um, the, um, the, the, um, the, the choices that we make and the sound quality. And, I'm, and I'm, in a minute, I'm gonna talk about some things that, they, some points that you guys just brought up. Um, so some of these instruments uh, sound, you know, I'm talking about the modern ones. That, so if you've got a, a, a modern built uh, metal strung harp, um, your, you know, every builder makes their harps a little bit different. Every harp is, you know, a little bit unique. And uh, for some of you, you're, you might have an instrument that sounds really great in the bass and maybe not as great in the treble or the other way around, or maybe you have one that, that sounds great from the treble to the bass. You know, uh, so um, some of us might be subconsciously making choices um, that, for example, let's say you have a harp that doesn't sound so good in the treble. And I know that some of the modern built metal strung harps are don't speak that well in the treble because of the way they're constructed up here compared to the historical instruments. Um, so you might have a harp that sounds better in the bass and you might subconsciously uh, be gravitating towards playing the strings down there because they just sound better. And in turn, the knock on effect is you might decide, well, okay, I'm down, I'm playing down here a lot and I don't want to be doing this because that's not good for my back. So I'm going to lift the harp up so that I can reach those strings a little bit easier. Um, so that would in, in turn affect, you know, how you position the instrument and where you're placing your arms on the instrument. Although I find, at least for my harp, the way I have it positioned, um, I'm able to um, comfortably reach, you know, most of the way down to the base, well, actually all the way, because I tune, when I'm tuning it, I tune with my left hand, or play with my left hand and tune with my right. I can reach the, the whole compass comfortably with my left hand, and if I needed to with my, with my right hand uh, as well. Um, so that's, you know, that, but that's something that can affect how you position the instrument subconsciously. Um, I'm just, sorry, I just need to flip my page over here because I've lost my train of thought for a second here. Okay, one of the things that I find really interesting about these historical wear marks is, and this is something that I've noticed that not a lot of modern players are doing, is that when we were looking at those diagrams I made, the wear is on the, on the left side, sorry, I'm turn around, on this side of the harp, the harper's left side, it's 
all the way up in the treble. It's up here. It's like between, most of it's between that top sound hole and the, the, the top of the, 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 the top of the sound box, the, the top of the soundboard here. It's most of it's like right in here. That's all the way up in the treble. And um, for the Brian Baru harp in particular, not only, it, well, first of all, what it tells me is that, you know, they're, they're playing up here, I think. Uh, and one, one of the reasons I think that is um, the wear on the Brian Baru harp, it's not just on the edge or on the corner here, okay? It's actually on the, a little bit on the front surface of the soundboard. So um, they were actually, I think, that is actually due to the heel of the player's hand resting onto the, a little bit onto the front of the soundboard. It, you know, if you look at the harp, it almost looks like, the wear almost looks like a, 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 a stair tread that's been walked on many times and sort of worn down into the front of the sound box there. And I think that was the, the, from the, the heel of the player's hand. Let me turn it around so you can see like that. Um, and I think that that is an indication that they, you know, they weren't just doing this. So they weren't just playing down here and they're, they're, if they were just playing down here and then just not playing up here at all, or not very often, uh, you would see most of the wear would be on the side and on the corner. But we're seeing it on the front as well, on the front edge. And so they're not just doing this, they're actually playing up here with their hand like that. And that's what's creating that wear. And I think that's very interesting and important for um, modern day players to be aware of, because I think a lot of us have a tendency to focus on the strings down here. And actually, the this historical wear indicates that they the historical players, they were playing up here a lot, these strings all the way up here in the treble. Okay. And also, um, I think that they were playing, at least up here, fairly close to the soundboard because of the way their, their hand must have been positioned. You know, so they weren't playing up by the tuning pins, they were playing down here. Um, and where you, someone mentioned uh, in the chat, you know, where you're plucking the string actually does affect the sound of that string. And let me demonstrate, uh, if I pluck the string in the middle, I get a nice round tone as I move towards the ends. You hear that? It becomes it becomes more nasal as you move to the ends of the strings. So not only which strings you're choosing to play affect the sound of your, your instrument, but where along that string you're choosing to play. And if you are placing, let's say you're, you're, you're placing your arms just inside where we're seeing that historical wear mark, which would be for the Lama harp would be in here. Okay. Um, so in the Lama harp, it's like here, here and here. Um, if you're playing down, down here, where you've got your arm, if I have my arm up here, I'm plucking the string there in the middle. If I've got my arm down here, I'm plucking that string closer to the sound box. I'm going to get a different sound out of that string. Okay, so where you're placing your arms not only affects which strings you can comfortably reach, but where you're plucking that string either in the middle or the, the top end or the bottom end, and that's going to affect the sound of that string. And in fact, if I keep my arm up here and I if I'm playing down here, I might not, I, you know, this is, this is probably the, the, the base end of, of um, where the treble hand would be playing. So, you know, I can, I can reach the middle of the string without, you know, going beyond where that wear mark is, but it's 
possible, you know. Maybe they were playing, you know, a little bit higher up or a little bit lower down. If you play higher up, you get a, a sound more like a harpsichord. But the, these are things to be aware of. Uh, but certainly you can you can be plucking in the middle of the, of the string and still stay within where we see the, the historical harpers were holding their harps. Um, Karen, it occurs to me watching you, if you don't mind my breaking in. Go ahead. What did you say? Uh, it just occurs to me watching you that when you're playing the lower strings with your left hand, you're just not making as much contact with the soundboard. So could it be that what you're that you're not seeing so much the range that they were playing in, but just where the hand happens to contact the soundboard? That's that absolutely. That's a really good point. And what happens is I'm I'm not contacting the um, the the front of the soundboard as much. But I don't know if you can see it. Um, I, I'd have to move the camera all the way to the other side. But I'm actually rubbing against the side of the, of the sound box when I'm down here. So if I'm down here, I'm actually hitting the uh, edge and the side. And then when I get up to here, it's more a little bit more onto the front. And on my own harp, I actually can, I've had this long enough that I can see the wear marks of where I've been, I've been playing. And I, um, you made a really good point because I, um, I used to play my instrument on the right shoulder. And, um, but, before I say that, I, I wanted to say, let me just hold that thought for a second. Um, you, you make a really good point there. Uh, however, I'm, I'm not doing this. So I don't have my arm off of the sound box when I'm playing down here. Um, now they might have, but this is actually uncomfortable. I have to consciously keep my elbow raised if I want to play down here and not contact the sound box. And if I was doing that after a little while, that becomes fatiguing. Um, so I think it is less likely that they were just not contacting the sound box that they were playing down here and they just weren't rubbing against the sound box at all. Uh, because that you actually have to consciously think about holding your arm away from the sound box. And if you're just in a relaxed position, you're playing down here. I'm actually touching the sound box if I play down here. Uh, it's just touching on the side and on the corner instead of more onto the front. And I, I know from my own um, watching myself play and from the position of my own wear marks, I could see um, that I was actually playing farther down. I'm, you know, uh, up until fairly recently, I was, I was playing, you know, down here. And I'd have to arch down to do that right now. And that brings me to something else I wanted to point out. Um, looking at the, the historical wear marks, um, except for that oddity at the end with the, the mullamast harp, um, we don't see a lot of overlap with the, the position of the wear in the right hand and the position of the wear in the left hand. And again, if I'm, if I'm playing, let's say I wanted to play up here with my, if I wanted to bring my bass hand up, play up here, uh, you would see that in the wear on these old harps. Okay, you wouldn't be doing this because that's, you've really got to stick your elbow out and then all of a sudden now your wrist is at a funny angle. So they wouldn't have done that. Um, if, if you're just playing with your arm comfortably, and you had it up here, you'd be rubbing against the sound box. We're just not seeing that wear up here. The base, the extent of the base hand wear, it really just stops right about here. So we're not seeing people doing this and you know doing this with the base hand. And also because of the way these harps are constructed, um, you know they're not they're they're asymmetrical. Um, the strings are are strong on the on the left hand side. If you are um, bringing your, your right hand up here, it's actually 
you have to squeeze your hand underneath the neck to reach the treble strings. And that's awkward. Um, and this brings me to another thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I'm sorry we've, we've gone over a little bit, but this is actually just about the last thing I wanted to talk about. And it's, it's, it's really important. And I, I, so if you bear with me for about five more minutes, uh, this is actually key. Um, I want to preface this by saying that um, I know some modern day players of this instrument, although the we know the historical players played with their left hand in the treble and the right hand in the bass. And we know that from the, not only from historical written information, but from observing the instruments. Uh, I, I know that some people today choose to play um, with the harp on the right shoulder with the right hand playing the treble and the left hand playing the bass. And I actually, myself, when I was first learning how to play this harp, I started out playing that way with the harp on my right shoulder, with my right hand playing the treble and my left hand playing the bass. And I don't want anyone to feel self-conscious if that's the way you play your harp. It's, you know, how you choose to play your instrument is up to you. I'm not, you know, trying to call anybody out. However, there are some interesting knock-on effects with the way you choose to, you know, how you have it positioned. Um, when I was, when I started playing way back when, and I had the harp like this, well, for one thing, if you want to play the, the treble strings all the way up at the top end, you, like I said, you have to cram your hand under the neck because of the way these harps are constructed. And this is a different from the uh, lever harps. I know their, their frames are, are made a little bit differently, but for this kind of instrument, the, the metal strung harps, um, that's awkward, right? And so you might not choose to play notes up there because it's really kind of awkward to cram your hand under there. So you would then, uh, you'd be less likely, less inclined to play the, the strings all the way up in the treble if, like my harp, if, you know, it's a little bit awkward for you to reach those because you have to reach under the neck to get them. So that's going to have an effect on the choices you make uh, when you're playing music on your harp. Um, another important thing I noticed about left versus right shoulder is um, the posture. So I noticed that when I was playing this way originally with the harp on the right shoulder, and I apologize if I'm over here and you can't see me as well, um, I had the harp higher up. And the reason I had it higher up is because I was looking at the strings when I was playing them. And this is, this is why I want you to bear with me because this is really important point to, to make, especially for those of you who are players of these wire strung harps. Um, if you are a right-handed person, I'm right-handed, um, and you're playing with the instrument on your left shoulder, you're, you're with your left hand playing the treble strings. Um, for a right-handed person, um, well, let me back up for a second. If I, when I'm playing my harp on the left shoulder and I've got the left hand playing the treble, I can't see my left hand because the tuning pins blocking the view. Right? I, and the neck. I can't see my, even if I'm down here, I still can't see my left hand. You can see it. I can't see it, actually. It's not in my line. My line of sight is here. My hand is, my left hand is hidden. So I play my left hand without looking at it, without looking at what strings it is playing. And uh, something that Ann Heyman pointed out to me years ago when I was first learning how to play this instrument is that if you are a right-handed person, you are more able to uh, do things with your left hand without looking at that hand while you're doing it. Whereas your right hand is more hand-eye coordinated. You're more likely to be looking at your right hand while you're using your right hand. This is for right-handed people. Um, so when I play my harp, I, I don't look at my left hand and I, because I can't see it anyway, even if I wanted to look at it. But I find that I don't need to look at my left hand 
when I am playing. My left hand is able to play those strings and figure out which strings it needs to be playing without me looking at it. It does take practice to do that. But that means that I have my, I am able to have my harp lower down at a comfortable position. You know, and, and that again affects where I'm placing my hands on the sound box as we talked about earlier. When I was a right shoulder player, and again, I'm right-handed, um, I, I needed to look at my right hand playing the treble notes. Uh, I, I, I could not play without looking at the hand. Now, some people can, or you know, there may be some of you today who are playing on your right shoulder and you're not looking at your hands while you're playing. But I, in my just casual observation, I've noticed that most right-handed, uh, right shoulder players who are playing their harp like this are looking at their hands when they're playing. And if you are, you are, likely to be more inclined to lift the harp up because if you want to see clearly see what strings you're playing and you don't want to be hunched over you need to lift the instrument up so that you can see them and that's what I found that I was doing I had the harp higher up because I was looking at the strings and that in turn was affecting the choices I was making on which strings I was gravitating towards playing, I was I found that I was playing lower down the instrument. I was doing arrangements that were lower down the instrument. And whatever I was doing, it was different from what was being done historically. And we can then think about, this is food for thought. I don't have all of the answers today, but what I can say is that if my wear marks uh, are different from what the historical harpers were doing. And I can see on my own harp, my wear marks were lower down. I had the harp higher up and I can see it on my own instrument. I can see where I had my arms, they were lower down. And so I was doing something that was different from what the historical harpers were doing. And I can go on and uh, you know, I can go away and I can think about, okay, what am I doing that's different and how might that be affecting the way the music sounds, my playing style and, and how that comes out when I perform. And that's what I would like you to go away with today. Um, so I'm gonna stop talking because I've run a little bit over um, and we'll save for another day, I can talk about the other signs of, of use on the instruments, but I, I don't wanna keep you now. Uh, but I'd like to open it up to more questions because I loved all of your comments have been absolutely excellent and really good food for thought. This is what we want to have. We want to have everybody thinking about these things because you know if we all give our input, that helps us all understand it better and helps us all get get us all thinking. So I, if anybody has any any comments before we we sign off for today, I would love to open it up and have have people say things. Uh. Hi, Karen. I have one, Nancy, again, I have one more question. I wondered why with, I wrote notes here, the Lamont notes, the Queen Mary and the Otway, their marks went much longer, like the Queen Mary, the treble um, mm -hmm. left side was 2 to 15. So you have 13 string holes versus, say, the um, first one you showed the Brian Baru that was four to 10 or 11. So you had strings about six or seven string holes there. So what's with the longer marks? <laughs> That's a great question. And I think the answer there is because of the lighting conditions under which I was observing those other instruments. The Brian Baru harp, that first one, I was only able to look at it in the long room library, which is slightly dimly lit. Um, so I, I suspect if I was able to look at that harp in, in, the, in the lab under you know, adequate lighting, let's say I had it you know, next to the other ones, if I could compare them side by side, I would, pro I would expect to see a greater extent of the wear. I can't say that for certain, but I, I suspect that would probably be the case, that it's about the lighting. Remember at the very beginning, I said that um, if you don't have adequate lighting, you're, you can easily overlook 
this wear entirely, especially the tail, you know, the tail end of it. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to see where it's really, really worn in. Like I, like I said, like an old uh, stair tread, but the, the tail end where it gets starts to just sort of tail off and get fainter, you need good lighting to see that. So I suspect that if we were to examine the Brian Baru harp under in the lab, that we would see more wear. Any other questions? Yes, who made your harp? This was made by Guy Flockhart. He's based in Wales. He's in Cardiff. And I believe he is, um, I believe he may still be making harps. Uh, this was made in 2006. I've had it since, no, I'm sorry. It was made in 1996. I have had it since 2006. And if you actually, if you want, oh, I should bring up, let me go to your screen one more time. Hang on a second. And let me just, let me just zoom on. Sorry, this is all other stuff that we, we didn't look at today, but don't worry. That's the Queen Mary Harp, by the way. Uh, let me just go to the last, there we go. Uh, I just wanted to give you the um, links. Um, you can find more information uh, about the early Irish harp and you know where you can and you know activities and teachers and things like that. If you go to uh, irishharp.org, and also I would encourage you if you're really interested, um, um, if you enjoyed this workshop um, and you'd like to see more of this kind of thing, uh, it would be lovely if you if you um, supported the Historical Harp Society of Ireland if you feel inclined to do so. Uh, also, the Harp Ireland link there for more Harp Day events. On my website, I didn't put my own personal um, e website address up there because I didn't want to do it. I'm doing this for the Historical Harp Society of Ireland, and I didn't want to do any self-promotion. But if you Google me, uh, I, uh, actually, my website is just uh, um, karenloomis.com. And I have a resources page that has a list of links to harp makers of these kinds of harps. So if you are uh, interested in having a harp like this one made and you want to find out who makes them, uh, if you go to KarenLumis.com, that's me, uh, and just click on the link that says resources, I've got uh, a, a bunch of active, currently active harp makers of, of these kinds of metal string harps. Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll guess, I guess I'll leave that up there so that you guys can, can, can see that. Did anyone have any other questions or comments? Well, one thing I'm going to add is that I tend to find myself gravitating away from the larger floor harps, the larger lever harps, simply because I don't find that I'm using the base as far down. Uh, it requires me to move a lot and to stretch quite a bit, which I find very uncomfortable. Additionally, I find it's far easier for me to concentrate on anything from middle C up far easier than it is for me to worry about anything middle C down. So that kind of lends itself to a more of a, uh, a more co compact Celtic design and or a metal strung Brian Baru type of uh, configuration. Uh, simply because I just don't find it comfortable and it's not necessarily the kind of playing I want to do. Thank you. Yeah, that's 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 certainly and again, yeah, I think comfort is is key to me. I think if, if you're doing something and you notice that it's it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, it's a strain, that's you know, listen to your listen to that little voice in your head that's saying, This doesn't feel right, you know. So absolutely. And let me I want just to thank I, you very much for the observations about left and right handedness because um, I've been playing the the right hand, the right shoulder uh, variation, and I am right handed, but I play lots of other instruments, all of which have the melody in the left hand. So yeah, I'm and, really looking yeah, forward to trying that out. Yeah, and that's a that's a that's a good point. And there are a lot of people who like you who who. Um, who do that for that very reason. Um, I, um, one of the things I noticed when I was switching, you know, when I, when I switched from playing 
uh, right hand treble to playing left hand treble. Um, I know there are some people who say, oh, I could never change um, um, uh, because it would be confusing. I found that, um, and again, this is a different situation to you where, because I don't play other types of harps uh, where, I, where I would need to do switch shoulders. But I found that um, it was actually um, the way I managed to switch is I can, what I did is I continued to play on my right shoulder with the right hand playing the treble and the left hand playing the bass. And at the, instead of going cold turkey, I, I practiced both ways. And uh, I gradually increased the amount of time that I was playing with the harp on my left shoulder until I got to the point where I was only playing with the harp on my left shoulder and not spending any time playing with the harp on my right shoulder. So I did a, a gradual shift where I was doing both at the same time. And rather than finding that confusing or disabling, uh, it was like cross training my playing actually improved by doing that. Like I said, it was kind of like cross training. It was actually, I, it actually helped my practice. And I, interestingly, I found that um, as, as, as many of you know, that the playing this instrument, there's a lot of sort of ornaments that you play with the, in the treble. And there's a lot of very fiddly finger movements. And uh, interestingly, I found that those, the knowledge of how to do, how to execute those little fiddly fingerings transferred to my left hand without me having to think about it. They were somehow stored in a central area in my brain. And my brain said, okay, do this fiddly thing. I'm just going to apply that fiddly bit to the other hand now. I had to build up the strength and dexterity in my left hand to do the, the treble work, but it was very interesting that it, it, my brain knew how to do these ornaments, even though that hand hadn't done them before. And there was even one ornament that I would, had been doing incorrectly, and that, that mistake transferred over to the left hand. It was very funny. So yeah, I found it uh, enlightening, uh, switching sides. Uh, but for sure, you know, I understand um, that people have reasons for choosing to play on the right shoulder, particularly like you said yourself, you, you play other instruments with the um, treble uh, being played by the right hand. I actually, it was the other way around. Everything else I played, the, the melody is in the left hand. Oh, so okay. So I've been having trouble getting melody on the harp, but my right hand does not want to do melody. Oh, so, okay, all right. So do you think you, you might think about then, are you gonna think oh, about this? Yeah. <laughs> well, feel I'm free to get in today. touch with me if you, need, if you need coaching or advice. Cause yeah, I found it was actually a mind expanding experience and it actually improved my playing overall. And it was not as difficult as you might think. The key is don't go cold turkey. Don't just say, okay, I'm never, I'm gonna play on this side and I'm never gonna play on the other side again because you'll you'll go out of your mind. It's frustrating. And I think that's what, where a lot of people get hung up is they try to just switch, you know, 100% one day and then they, they find, oh, I can't play anything. This is terrible. And then they give up. You know, just keep playing on your right hand because you need to, your brain needs to keep knowing the, your repertory, right? Because it takes a while. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes, you know, months. Um, and just gradually, uh, when you're practicing, spend a little bit more time each day, you know, start by just spending five minutes playing on the left shoulder. And then, you know, each day, increase that amount of time that you're playing with the harp on the left shoulder and decrease gradually the amount of time that you're playing with the harp on your right shoulder as you practice until you get to the point where it's 100%. And I think that's actually a better way to do it because you're keeping your mind and your hands in condition with your repertory. You're not just, you know, cutting yourself completely off. And it, I found it wasn't frustrating at all. It was actually, you know, empowering and it helped my playing overall. So, 
Karen, let me just, that yeah. would be a little, little bit more difficult for the those of us who play lever heart because the levers are on the left side and we need to be able to uh, see, the, see them to know which ones to flip, especially when there's accidentals in the piece. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say yeah. the, the, the lever harp is a right shouldered instrument, unless you happen to have one that was built the other way around. But yeah, so that's in, that instrument is made and intended to be played on the right shoulder. Absolutely. And I would say there's no reason for you, unless you wanted to, or, or, or if you were a player of both kinds of instruments, and you wanted to just play them both the same way. Uh, but for sure, uh, the lever harp, you know, like you said, the way it's constructed, you need to be able to see those. It would be very awkward if you had it over here and you had to, you know, flip levers and get the necks in the way now, and it just wouldn't work out. And actually, the the so the the metal strung harps, their construction's different, and uh, they don't have levers, um, and. Um, they were, you know, one of the things I noticed when I was examining the the older instruments like the Queen Mary um, is the there are there's evidence on the instrument where they're like nail marks where there used to be decorative badges and things like that and the decoration on um, in general uh, like for example like on the tuning pins is a little bit more focused on the right hand side of the harp and one reason i think for that is that because they were playing on their left shoulder if you think about this uh historically they're if they're pl they're playing for somebody who's a very high status person the, the harp player the musician is they were high status but they were there to play for a noble or a king or whatever uh, the chieftain or whoever, somebody very high status, and they're showing the right hand side of the instrument to whoever the VIP is, the important person in the audience that they're playing for. So they're showing the decorated tuning pin ends. There's the this side of the harp, they've, they've gone to a little bit of extra effort on this side in terms of adding little extra decorative badges and things like that. So they're showing this is like the money side of the harp. And if you think about it, it's the right hand, they're, they're, they're presenting the right hand side of their body and the right hand side of their instrument to the important person, not the left hand side. The left hand side of the harp is the side that has the string windings. It's not as, you know, decorative looking. It's, and I wonder if there was, you know, that was out of politeness partly that you you wouldn't want if you're playing on your with the harp on your right shoulder you would your important person that you're playing for they're looking at the left hand side of the harp they're seeing the string windings they're seeing the left hand side of your body was that i wonder was that not the done thing you know would you would it be considered rude historically you know we're, we have to put ourselves into the medieval era we have to think like we're a medieval person we're in the 14th century and we're playing for you know a nobleman or somebody like that. Would it at that time period have been considered rude to be showing them the left hand side of the harp? Think about it this way: like a, a harpsichord, they're very highly decorated. But something that a lot of people don't realize: the the uh, spine of the harp. A lot of harpsichords. That's the long straight part that's often up against a wall. That's not even painted. It's just rough sawn wood. Uh, imagine if somebody was giving a harpsichord recital and, you know, normally the harpsichord's up on the stage and you can, the lids open, it's a beautiful painting there and it looks great, you know, everything. What if they put the harpsichord up there and it was facing the other way around so that the audience was seeing the back of the instrument? You'd be like, what? That's not right, right? So I'm wondering if, you know, this is like the back of the instrument back then, historically. Another thing that I thought about with this is, and I think about this every time I tune my harp. These are metal strings, and particularly for the low-headed harps that are lower down, it's below eye level. When I'm tuning, if one of these strings snaps, it goes flying up. That piece of wire goes flying up this way. If I'm tuning and if I've got the harp on my right shoulder, I'm right in the line of fire. For those yeah. if a string breaks yeah you know it can put my eye out or hit me in the face 
and, and I, and, and so if you've got the harp on your left shoulder, if you break a string, it's going to fly up over your left shoulder. It's not going to hit you necessarily. It's not going to get you in the face. But if you're like this and you're, you know, you're tuning it up and you're going, mm, if one of those strings breaks, it could get you right in the eye. Uh, and so I think about that every time I'm tuning. I th and I, I think about people who play with the harps over there and I'm watching them tuning. I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to put an eye out. You know, I get worried for people. So anyway, that's just my thoughts about that. And sorry. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Change the subject here um, for no reason, just to because I have a question. Um, the difference in spacing of strings between, say, the Trinity and the Sir, is there a difference? And how does that difference affect where the wear marks are? Do the wear marks consistently fall within certain string notes? Oh, that's an that excellent question. And um, I don't know the specific answer to that. Um, I'd have to go examine the SIR to see uh, if, what the string spacing is. I know uh, I'm pretty sure the string spacing, for example, like on the Lamont, I think is a little bit more widely spaced than yeah. say the Trinity. So yeah, they're certainly not all the same. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's a little bit wider on like the SIR. They're not huge, they're not gonna be hugely different. Uh, and the reason is because of the way these instruments are played, um, you are, instead of plucking the strings like you would on oh, yeah, uh, the lever part, yeah, you're, you're actually striking them and you're doing... Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so these harps, these metal strung harps, for those of you who might not be aware, the strings are closer together than they are on the lever harp. <laughs> because you're not sticking your hand, your fingers in between the strings, you're actually striking them on the side. Um, but that's a really, really good question about the spacing. And uh, I guess one of the things that it's, it's helpful to make a note of where the wear mark is with respect to the string number, the string hole number, because then you can, you can key it up to, okay, it goes down to this string number on this harp and it goes down to this string number on that harp, regardless of, of the spacing of, of whether or not the spacing of the strings on those two harps are different, if that makes sense. Well, I better let you go because we've gone way over. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, and I loved all of your questions and comments. And I know someone asked me to play something. Um, I should I should point out I'm not a professional musician. I'm a professional scientist. Um, so it, uh, if I were to play something, it wouldn't be high quality music. But what I would what I do recommend you do is if you go to the uh, Historical Harp Society of Ireland website. Um, there is a there's a little video on the on the homepage of the website that and you'll be able to hear some people playing their instruments. In fact, it, there's there's a clip of Siobhan Armstrong, the director of the Historical Harp Society of Ireland, playing her beautiful copy of the Trinity College Brian Brew Harp, and she is a fantastic player. So you can see and her, hear her playing her instrument. Um, so I anyway, thank you so much again. And um, I enjoy the rest of Harp Day. And do feel free to, you all have my email address. So do feel free to get in touch with me if you've got comments or questions. I loved everything you all had to say. That was really wonderful food for thought. Now I'm gonna go away and think about what everybody said. So, um, oh, one, one last thing. Is there anywhere in the, <coughs> in the historical records of who owned, played at the older harps? Yes, uh, well, for, so the, in particular, the downhill harp that I showed you a picture of, we know that instrument was owned and played by Dennis O'Hampsey. And that's really important because we also have some of his repertory preserved by Edward Bunting in his uh, manuscript notes. So not only do we have the instrument, 
we know who owned and played it, and we have some of his repertory. Um, so, which is fantastic when you have all of those three things so, to answer that question. But anyway, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope to hear from some of you. Bye-bye.